nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum, benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccatoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostra. Nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Brethren in Christ, laudetu Jesus Christus. In secula seculorum, amen. This is Timothy Flanders with the meaning of Catholic. Jesus is King. I'm joined today by Dr. Jegosh Ignatik. Dr. Ignatik, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Dr. Jagosh Ignatik is the Associate Professor of Theology at the Pontifical College Josephinum, which is the only pontifical Catholic seminary outside of Rome. He earned his STL at the International Theological Institute in Gaming, Austria. His PhD is from the Pontifical John Paul II Institute for Studies on Marriage and Family in Washington, D.C. He is the author of Person and Value, Carol Wojtyla's Personalistic Normative Theory of Man, Morality, and Love. He is the translator of Carol Wojtyla, Love and Responsibility. That's linked below. And he's also the translator of the new uh, English critical edition of the works of Carol Wojtyla, John Paul II, Volume 1, Person and Act and Related Essays. And so we'll be talking about that today. The subject today is the Feast of St. John Paul II. And so we're talking about the greatness of St. John Paul II. What makes him so great? This is a question that some, some people, I think, of the younger generation may not realize um, if, they, if they didn't grow up under John Paul II's pontificate or, or were too young at the time. And John Paul II also has his own critics as well. So we'll be addressing some of the critical uh, remarks of John Paul II. And so we're greatly honored to have Jagos Ignatik with us. And so uh, Dr. Ignatik, can you first give us some of the context um, of John Paul II's pontificate? He ra he's raised to the Sea of Rome in 1978. Can you tell us a little bit about the world and the church at that time, and what was the effect of his pontificate? Yes. Well, as probably everyone knows, in those days, uh, the Cold War was still in place, if you look historically at what, what was going on uh, in the world. Uh, it was a divided world, and um, Poland was under the influence of, of communism. Uh, but uh, what was going on in the church was, of course, um, the implementation of the Second Vatican Council. And I think you cannot speak about John Paul II without uh, mentioning that. Yes, his name, John Paul, that he chose, uh, indicates that he was devoted to implementing the council. And uh, because, first and foremost, he was a, a, a participant in the council. Yes, he experienced it. He um, intervened. There are 20 some, 23, 20 or 24 people who have different numbers uh, of his interventions, oral and written, at the council. So, um, so that that is that is the context. And uh, so his greatness. Yes, this is a you know a, we say in Poland uh, a, a theme like a river. You we could speak about many aspects of, of his greatness, of his personal greatness, or those things he accomplished in his life, and perhaps we'll, we'll do both to some extent. Um, but the question of, yes, go ahead. Oh, yeah, 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 just go ahead. There's many different aspects of his greatness, certainly. Yes, and so uh, if we, I thought about this theme. Yes, you suggested the theme, a uh, very profound theme of greatness. And last, last Sunday, we had a gospel reading about the greatness, who is the greatest among the apostles and uh, the following of, uh, followers of Jesus. And um, I think it's, it's important to look at greatness uh, from that kind of perspective, not from a worldly perspective of power and coercion, but rather of uh, how well someone is uh, conformed to Christ and how well he is, uh, uh, he expresses the, the love of God in this world. And uh, I, I think John Paul II is, is uh, you know, a 
perfect example of a man who um, who lives for others. Yes, I think the greatness of, of him is that he conforms himself to Christ um, perfectly, profoundly, uh, by which he properly responds to, to revelation. Uh, he responds to God's love for man with love and with devotion, with a total entrustment. And so in this way, um, he is great. Can you tell us at all about John Paul II's prayer life or his personal holiness? Yeah, yes, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try. Uh, definitely, he was a man of prayer. Yes, he was a, a man of communion, a, a man of prayer. He prayed all the time, uh, tried in various different ways. Yes, his whole life, in a sense, you could, you could look at his whole life as a, as, as, as a prayer, as, a, as an entrustment of himself to God and, and um, a, an effort to do God's will. Uh, it's not so difficult to do it. I, I mean, definitely his greatness uh, is uh, due to this, this entrustment, this, this dialogue with God. Yes, we speak a lot about dialogue because di uh, in the church because dialogue is uh, God's way of communication. If you think about the Trinity, uh, or if you think about how God enters into a, a, a dialogue with man, how he communicates with man, that's all in terms of dialogue. And John Paul II definitely uh, lived uh, that way in dialogue with, with God. And, um, and then from that um, basis um, in dialogue with man. Excellent. There's a, I wanted to recommend to viewers as well, there's this issue of communio which is all about Carol Wojtyla, which is a great introduction to his thought. Uh, Dr. Ignatik has an essay and a translation in this volume. So that's linked below. But I, I wanted to preface my next question with this quote from Hans Urs von Balthasar from 1988, where he's reflecting on John Paul II. And he says this, the spirituality of our Holy Father, John Paul II, is a unique refutation <clears throat> of the weary resignation of many Christians today who think that the truths of the revela of revelation are too old to be true anymore. The colossal spiritual vitality of our Pope shows instead that precisely these central truths and they alone are capable of leavening all the problems that are present and he will develop them. Now, I thought that was uh, a, seems to be a good summation of the effect of his holiness on the faithful. Uh, can you speak at all about the revival? It seems that there was a great renewal and revival among the faithful under his pontificate. Yes, um, I think a lot of this revival stems from um, from Vatican II, for John Paul II. Yes, he he truly believed that the Holy Spirit um, was present and assisted uh, the Council. Now, uh, the revival, if we think about the revival in the church is, as I understand it, uh, we probably are talking about a certain reorientation toward God, a certain um, uh, more, uh, a deeper reception of the revelation. He, um, at the council, Wojtyla, uh, Bishop Wojtyla was, um, Notice that perhaps it happens that Christians do not draw from the proper sources of sanctification. Yes, so um, so one way is in which he would promote um, the um, how did you put it um, the reorientation or um, um, renewal revival revival yes revival being more alive is through uh, promoting sacramental life of the church, of the, of the faithful, basically uh, through catechesis. Yeah? So that, that we would uh, instruct each other in faith, uh, convey it. So this was one, one area you can think of, uh, of for example, uh, promotion of uh, adoration and so forth, which is a certain reception of, of uh, Jesus, our Lord, our Lord Christ. Um, there are um, 
other ways is other ways you could think about uh, revitalizing the evangelical uh, efforts that is going out and sharing your faith with the world, which in this case, through dialogue, which in this case has to be a certain mature faith. Yes, to do that and to prepare for evangelization means that you have been following Christ and are conformed to him in, in some way. Let me think if there's any other ways in which revitalize. Oh, the whole personalism, yes, the whole the whole focus on man, but not to the detriment of um, of God, but simply the focus on the value of the human person, the focus on the dignity of the person is also a trait, and which plays into the um, revitalizing revitalizing the church. I think these are just a number of 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 ideas, uh, I'm sure there are more. Uh, he said one, um, one time at the council or one of the co uh, committees, commissions that he was a member of, uh, that the holiness of the church is manifested in human persons. The, the whole idea that the, the question is why is person so valuable? Why, why the great dignity of the person is simply the answer is theological. It's because man is capable of, of welcoming God into his heart and uh, man is Kapak day. And that is kind of driving his, uh, his philosophy, his approach to the world uh, from this personal um, perspective. Yeah, you mentioned the dialogue with God. It reminds me of the story when he was first uh, when he was first appointed bishop. He was the priest and he went to the nearby convent and he prayed all night, um, and the the sisters were uh, very impressed with his prayer. And I, and I it, th it sounds like it was very evident to all who knew him that he was a man of intense prayer and dialogue with God. Uh, but that's yeah, that's ahead. right. And uh, just a story to confirm that uh, when I was in <clears throat> Krakow doing research for my translations at the at the Metropolitan. Uh, um, Kuria, the, uh, the bishop's palace there in, in Krakow, on uh, Franciszkańska, <laughs> uh, the street. Uh, I, I heard accounts of that fact that he would often go, when he was, when he was bishop of Krakow, he would also all, all <clears throat> often go and spend uh, hours in prayer. And actually people who worked there knew about that, and they would always... Um, be very respectful of that time that he spent uh, in adoration in the chapel. It was the same chapel in which he was ordained priest, and he would also write, do some writings there, but uh, they would be uh, respectfully, quietly um, uh, remove themselves from the, from the space to let him pray. Yeah, I, I, and I, I've also heard about that Eucharistic piety and how his life really restored something of Eucharistic piety because I understand in the 1970s, there was a, a great decline in Eucharistic piety. I, I've heard that Eucharistic adoration as a, as a practice had almost died out in, in many areas, but John Paul II personally practiced this everywhere he would go. He would go straight to the Eucharist, go straight to the chapel, and um, he would always be leading the people by example to adoration of our blessed Lord in the blessed sacrament. Um, That's right. Because I think because he understood just like uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, uh, Pope Benedict, that, that adoration is, is a way of reception of, of Jesus Christ. Well, one of the greatest things about John Paul II that what first introduced me to his greatness was the documentary, Liberating a Continent, John Paul II and the fall of communism. Um, so can you tell us about um, what was, what was St. John Paul II's role in uh, against Soviet communism, both in Poland and Eastern Europe? Uh, yeah, a little bit. That is um, definitely John Paul II realized the threat of atheism, first of all. So the atheistic principles of communism and so he realized it's a, it's a, it's a great danger. Yes, well, why is 
atheism so uh, so dangerous where well um, if you're an atheist then basically atheism says you can be happy without god you can live without god you don't need god for your fulfillment for your happiness and uh, living in communist poland john paul ii was was keenly aware acutely aware of that threat so at the council, he would make interventions about this and warn the council fathers about not necessarily um, and not uh, ignoring that fact. But communism in Poland, the way that he tried to overcome communism, first of all, there, there's this great principle, yes, a scriptural principle, um, which says that you need to overcome evil with good. That's the only way to overcome evil, not with evil, uh, but, but with good. And uh, a few days ago, we had a memorial of blessed Jerzy Popiłuszko. He was, um, he was a priest martyr who was uh, murdered by the communists in 1984. And uh, uh, he said something similar. He changed it a little bit, this, this saying, he said, only a person who is rich in goodness can overcome evil. It, it is, it, you, you see, this, this is a personalistic twist on, on that understanding. And if you think about John Paul II, I think it very much fits the, uh, the greatness of uh, the person of, of uh, St. John Paul II. Namely, he was a man rich in goodness. He was a man rich in mercy, and hence he would be able to overcome evil. Well, <clears throat> to continue, um, the Wojtyla noticed very quickly that there is a, a very communist anthropolo anthropology is very weak. It's very actually negative towards the human person and uh, mistreats the human person, treats uh, communities more important. As you know, uh, one human person could be sacrificed for the good of all. And uh, hence, Wojtyla, uh, at least we have always basically at the council and even before the council, uh, he would emphasize the dignity of the human person. This was kind of his, um, his principle in fight with the communism. If you emphasize the value of the human person, which we call dignity, then uh, by the very same fact you will be fighting with these atheistic and uh, negative pejorative um, anthropological principles of the communists and uh, that's what he implemented uh, throughout he was not a politician of course he worked with politicians like uh, ronald reagan but this anthropological personalistic uh, dimension of his um, emphasis on the dignity is 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 a, a tool um, for the fight against communism. Yes, the emphasis on a, a Christian personalism certainly addresses the fundamental modern question of what is man, going back to the French Revolution, the rights of man, and then communism comes in and talks about the rights of the poor, but just objectifies them, you know, as you said, a, in a utilitarian sense. And so this, this idea of personalism and what is man and what is a person? And the, the term person even is, is really a uh, counter-revolutionary term, uh, I say, uh, definitely. Um, but I think his, yeah, his life really exemplifies the power of the gospel because I love the story how he, he's consecrated bishop in 1958. And the, one of the first things he does is he goes to Nova Hutta which is the communist dystopian city that they've built without a church. And he goes there and starts celebrating every year the Christmas midnight mass out in the field for the workers. And he does that every single year. just And they're just preaching the gospel, which is just preaching the gospel. And that is creating a movement of the faithful to oppose communism by the very fact that they are embracing the truth itself. That's right. And uh, a detail to that story is that uh, uh, the people of Nova Huta requested a church to be built. It was not imposed on them from above, as to speak, but they 
um, they wanted a church in their city and Wojtyla recognized that and this is how he talked to the communist government uh, saying you need we need a permission for the church because in those days you you needed a permission to build a church and there were always problems with obtaining a permission like that um, so which shows which shows that fundamentally a human person desires for God yes yeah, Saint Thomas would talk about that um, uh, in, uh, that everyone wants to be happy yes that implicit desire for God uh, but, but, uh, and Wojtyla, the, the whole story about Nova Huda shows that. And, um, yeah. Yes, it's, it's such a crescendo. And it's, it's so Weigel in his biography mentions how the communists totally underestimated him initially. They thought he was just this philosopher, academic guy. And they said, oh, yeah, we want him as Archbishop of Krakow because he's just going to philosophize but they didn't they totally underestimated the power of the gospel and how he continued to just preach the truth preach the truth and he would fearlessly face the communists like when they try to take over the seminary he just went and faced them and and told them <laughs> and worked it out and, and by the time it was 1978 and he was coming back to poland as john paul ii that's the famous moment when he starts preaching the gospel and everyone's spontaneously crying out we want god and by that time, the communists are just really afraid of John Paul II. They, they don't want him anywhere near Poland. Uh, they're, they're just trembling uh, in the face of just preaching the gospel. Well, hence the attempt of assassination in, in 83. Uh, the, um, something else came to my mind as, as you spoke, namely that uh, for John Paul II, the person, the desire for God is simply a, a, of, the, of the person is, is, is a Kind of a manifestation of this fundamental link that God has with with God that um, uh, namely that human person is uh, transcendent yes Wojtyla in his writing says that transcendence is the second name of the person is how he sees the person uh, we I did not mention this whole uh, switch or anthropological switch that is that Wojtyla uh, Wojtyla employed in his uh, thought, namely, uh, he uh, the switches from the co so-called so cosmological anthropology to uh, to personalistic one. Uh, namely, Wojtyla saw a human person not simply reduced to the world. And under communism, you could see how that happens. That is, if Marxism is the the rule and the ideology, which tells you that um, man is simply reduced to matter and undergoes evolutionary changes, um, simply matter defines him. Wojtyla, on the other hand, stressed that man is, cannot be reduced simply to the visible world, but transcends it, transcends it. And um, that is uh, one of the ways, uh, one, of the, one of the greatness of, of, of his thought and the way he applied it. And there's one more actually in the fight with communism that is very important, namely, uh, which I forgot to mention, namely, it is the fight for the for marriage and the family, for um, uh, including the human body. But the marriage and the family, uh, the marriage as an as, as, as institution that comes, that originates from God and not from the state, is a very important tool for fight because against communism because communism communists wanted to destroy that starting by create destroy the family uh, destroy marriage and the family um, they they were speaking about liberating the woman from the housework hence they started uh, creating kindergartens and so forth so that the woman could could work and contribute to the uh, to building the paradise Earth. Yeah, yeah, the and uh, yeah, the communists in Poland were trying to take the youth away and uh, encourage them to be sexually immoral and whatnot. And um, in response, to and, this, uh, yes, and, and use some kind of propaganda yes. on them from the air, basically have the state let the parents let the children be brought by the state uh, according to the current ideology. Definitely. And Wojtyla's first book, Love and Responsibility, re really responds to this. It's, it's one of those one of the most profound books I've ever read on on this subject. It's really 
quite phenomenal. That's yes, like fifty nine, I believe. Yeah. Yes, it was the first the the first edition, I believe, is from nineteen sixty, but the uh, it's based on his lectures from the late fifties and his own observations, his own uh, integration of doctrine and life. But this is another point, that is uh, the, the area of sexual morality, that is another area uh, that shows the greatness of John Paul II, because he's, he's approaching this area from a personalistic perspective. If you take love and responsibility, you can see that there's a lot of talk about person there and trying to basically find out what is the nature of love, what, what is the nature of love and what is the nature of uh, use. Yes, Wojtyla <clears throat> opposes these two and he says by no way a person should be used as a, as a, as a means to some end by another person, but instead the proper relationship to a person is what we call love. It's just a matter of understanding what that love is, uh, whether you speak about marriage and relations between men and women, or between uh, children and parents, between teacher and, um, and uh, students, or in any area of life. And I, I think we have to, I didn't mention that, but we, well, I mentioned that indirectly when we spoke about uh, service and um, John Paul II giving his life to others in service, that's basically a way of loving. You know, love was, was the greatest, in a sense, theme in his life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to get to some of the criticisms of John Paul II, but before we do, which is kind of a preface to that, is understanding John Paul II is sometimes quite difficult. Um, this is something that Weigel talks about in the fact that his Polish character, his Polish mindset, uh, and also the Polish history um, gives us a little bit of a key to understand more John Paul II. So what is it about Poland and Polish history and Polish national character that helps us understand John Paul II? Yes, uh, it's uh, again, this is a very profound question and me being uh, Paul probably makes me uh, less competent to answer it. <laughs> Um, but um, first of all, we should remember that uh, the history of Poland, the birth of Poland as a nation, as a country, is tightly linked to Christian faith, to Christianity. The baptism of Poland took place in 966, and from that time on, Poland became, in a sense, uh, uh, one of the nations, um, uh, in, recognized nations in Europe. And I think that uh, Christian spirit is, in a sense, uh, imbued with Polish history in, in Poland and uh, reflected in its culture, in its uh, art. And that I think that is the main, the main uh, source of understanding uh, John Paul II as a as, as, as a Polish person. And of course, Pont went through various stages of, um, of being oppressed by others and of fighting for its freedom. That is also uh, relevant. But uh, Wojtyla, Wojtyla basically, I think uh, through the Polish experience, he realized how important freedom is and how precious that is for human persons for any country and he ap appreciated it because of the um, yeah uh, it's, very terrifying terrifying experience that, that yeah he went yeah i think um the, what i've noticed reading weigel and Buttiglione and yourself uh dr gnatic is a, as an american when we consider freedom from an American perspective, or like in the French Revolution, it's a very revolutionary concept of freedom, meaning we're breaking from the existing order, we're creating a new order based on freedom, whereas the Polish freedom is much more counter revolutionary, because it's it's trying to throw off the oppressor, whether it's the Russians or the Germans, or you know, whoever has invaded Poland at the time. Uh, 
it's it's trying to restore the order, restore 966, restore Polish Christendom, basically. And so it's it's a much different framework, especially when we talk about one of the biggest controversies of Vatican II, which is Dignitatis Humanae, which I think it, it really throws a lot more light into the way that John Paul II is approaching this for, as a poll versus Western Europe, America, and that type of thing. Yes, uh, I mean definitely, and and uh, it's a good comparison with other with these revolutions and certain understanding of freedom as a as, as a break from or from the past, break from tradition, break um, a certain indifference toward toward others that allows you to be whomever you wish to be and do whatever you want to do. Uh, however, the, the, the true freedom, Wojtyla understood that the true freedom is always, has to be understood in the context of truth. There is a, there is a unity between freedom and truth that you see in Wojtyla's works that is very, very important, e also with respect to this whole issue of religious freedom. I mean, freedom, he says at the council that freedom has to be responsible. And the responsibility is simply based on the truth about the world about man, about God, and um, uh, to have the freedom, but always in connection with truth, always looking in continuity with or the origin, you could say, the beginning, he has to use the biblical language, is, um, is key. And um, I, I think this is, this is what he, in his writings, in his teachings, um, you can you can you can see that you can recognize this. this. Both freedom and truth are linked, and they corroborate each other. And you cannot really have um, one with the other. Um, you it, we kind of are moving into this whole issue of religious freedom and um, a certain critique. Uh, so maybe we can we can talk about that now because I could. Continue. Yeah, certainly. So the. Um... The biggest critique um, on this, on uh, John Paul II, that I, I hear the most is the prayer meeting Assisi, uh, which was Archbishop Lefebvre and de Castro Mayer made this critique, and it's still heard today, of course. And the critique is a ba basically that in 1986, John Paul II gathered other religions, and he basically the critique is that he essentially fostered a breaking of the first commandment by bringing these religions together, telling them to pray, basically. And it also, the critique is that it, it, it fostered religious indifference because at least the optics of the event appeared, at least, uh, to tell the faithful that it doesn't really matter whether or not you accept the gospel or you're baptized, everybody can just kind of get along and pray together. So what is your uh, response to that critique, Dr. Ignati? Yes, um, my response would be definitely it is not true that this is a case of indifferentism or any way of uh, uh, forgetfulness of the gospel. In fact, if I, I went and I, I, I read the, uh, the speeches that John Paul II gave at the meeting, um, just, to, just to say, uh, to give a slight background, the speeches, uh, the, the, the meeting was initiated by John Paul II, as far as I know. And he simply wanted to uh, pray for peace. It's, it's a basically prayer for peace with, with his neighbors. I find um, nothing wrong with being a peacemaker. And I think this is, this is what expresses the, the idea or the intention of the meeting. Now, at the very meeting, he, what is, what is interesting, he, he, he boldly proclaims Christ to all the nations, you could say, to all the representatives of various religions. And he says that peace is from God and that peace is a gift from God in Jesus Christ. That is by praying for peace, in some way you are bound by a certain, certain way with the others because once you understand that peace is a gift from God, that and in some sense that unites you. And I think this was, this was an attempt to, for some, um, to increase the communion between people and uh, make the, the earth 
a better place to live and to respond to to revelation you 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 mentioned you mentioned uh, religious freedom and i think that is perhaps an aspect of that that whole issue of course it was it's a, it's a problematic for many people uh, they bring out the syllabus of errors and so forth well we don't have to talk about this i simply uh, right now i simply want to suggest uh, that uh, how to look at religious freedom uh, what what i think Wojtyla recognizes is that uh, faith and the church does that faith is a free act it's, it's a free act and should not be coerced and so re recognizing religious freedom by the civil government this is what what the um what the document is striving for it's it's so-called ad extra document um trying to encourage the the, the countries uh, particular nations to adopt this uh, civil uh, responsibility uh, so i think as i understand it religious freedom is simply an attempt to allow various states uh, any any type of state um, to at least not to place obstacles in the act of faith so it's by this is a certain contribution to to the gospel but that's how i understand it um, the act of faith faith has to be free and the state cannot place any obstacles uh, in its way. Yeah, I was just uh, looking up from Weigel where um, at the council, he connected the teaching of Dignitatis Humanae with the teaching of um, the 16th century, I'm sorry, 15th century Pole of the Academy of Krakow, Pavel Vladkovich who protested the forced conversion of pagans in the 16th Ecumenical Council, the Council of Constance. And so he's connecting this with a strong tradition and Polish tradition of that the gospel must be freely accepted and not forced. That's right. And religious freedom is meant to uh, help with that. It basically helps you to say yes to God. Anyway, so this is this this is an issue connected to I think to this whole um, uh, Assisi event. But overall, I think uh, John Paul II showed to be a great man at this meeting. Uh, showed to be one who um, who courageously um, shared his faith with others. So I don't think we can we can accuse him of any kind of uh, attempt at indifferentism or anything like that and yes yeah i think it's I, I think that when to me when you look at the polish context of freedom and this presenting the gospel as you say bringing these religions together and then presenting the gospel to them that's one way of of seeing it from sort of the polish context which is far more positive light and i think um, someone like lefebvre coming from a french context you can see why a, a frenchman or an american might see this in a in a more indifferent way because they are not connecting freedom and truth like Voitiva. exactly they're oh, saying just oh freedom gosh, for yes. whatever basically yes yes that is um that is the key if you uh, if you look at i, I may let me say i'd like to suggest that 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 um uh, the perspective namely uh, for me, John Paul II linked freedom with truth. Uh, freedom, uh, you need freedom to manifest the truth, yes? And true freedom is based on truth. The, um, if you look at uh, Bishop Lefebvre, uh, it seems that rather he focused on truth to the detriment of freedom. It was okay to coerce. Um, you, if you read his writings on, for example, on religious freedom, and uh, of course we agree that indifferentism is is uh, to be rejected, and everybody says that you read the Second Vatican Council or Boitewa, and and uh, you know that, that that's that's not a negotiable. But um, but on the other hand, we have uh, people who would stress freedom to the detriment of truth. That's kind of a second extreme. Uh, even though I have a great respect for Father jo John Courtney, uh, Courtney Mary, uh, you know, he could be understood in this light. 
yes, and his fight to understand in which way Catholics fit into the American society. So Lefebvre on one side, uh, John Courtney Murray on the other, and here in the middle we find Wojtyla with a certain understanding of um, unity between freedom and truth. Yes, and we could certainly do a whole show on this controversy. We don't have time to get into all the different aspects of it, but um, thank you for touching on that. Uh, one more piece of criticism, and then we can talk more about person and act. And that basically kind of comes from people thinking that John Paul II was a modernist, that he wasn't uh, a Thomist. He was this phenomenological person only. He was breaking from uh, the classical realist tradition. Um, can you tell us about um, John Paul II, the accusation of being a modernist, and his phenomenology. Um, how are we to understand that? If you understand modernism as a certain system that was condemned by the church, uh, for example, by Pius X, um, what was condemned is, was simply a focus on man uh, and his, so to say, horizontal dimension uh, to the exclusion of the vertical dimension, to the exclusion of his transcendence and, um, and relation to God. So we could have a denial of revelation that God really does not speak to you, uh, that you or you cannot know. It's kind of an ag agnostic philosophy drives this whole modernistic approach. Or you would uh, deny divinity of Christ. Yes, he was just a man, and that's how you would see him. Uh, or you would uh, deny... Uh, the divine origin of the church and her institutions like sacraments and priesthood. And there is no way that, that John Paul II can be ex uh, accused of, of doing that. Um, there has to be maybe a different understanding of modernism that I'm not aware of. Probably as a certain, you know, he could be accused by, uh, by people that he's breaking with tradition, which I also would argue that this is not the case. Um, but, but this is uh, this is I think the heart of the um, of the argument, and um, no, we have to answer it clearly that he has never uh, abandoned metaphysics. And if you read his writings, it's really clear that he has not. Even in his uh, phenomenological thought, that was meant to simply complement his. Uh, uh, metaphysics and metaphysical principles that that he used. Uh, otherwise, of course, he would fall into some kind of subjectivism, which he never did, and which also would be easy to do if you break yourself, if you separate yourself from being. Um, so, so I don't see it in in John Paul II. I don't see that he was a modernist, and I don't see that he was in any way uh, broke with uh, metaphysics. He himself says that he is, um, he was uh, attached to uh, existential Thomism and he remained uh, faithful to uh, St. Thomas and, and his metaphysics. Uh, one of the great, one of the aspects of his greatness is that he could integrate these two great philosophical traditions, metaphysics uh, with um, with phenomenology, because the point is to see reality, to see uh, the world as it is, to see man, uh, who he is, and to understand God. And um, these two ways of philosophi philosophizing uh, manifest, reveal some aspects of this reality to us. Yeah, uh, Boutiglione in his book on Carol Wojtyla mentions how St. Thomas really uh, sort of a insofar as he is Aristotelian, presents objective reality being, but does not as much investigate the subjective as much as the objective. And there really is both, obviously. And I actually asked this to one of my friends who's a, a very good Thomist. And I, wonder, I said, well, is this a mischaracterization of Thomas? And he said, no, there is, there is sort of this gap, I think, in Tom Thomism where, where Wojtyla does come in and he explores the subjective from a Thomistic perspective using some ph phenomenological tools. Um, and that goes right into our discussion of person and act. But before we do that, I wanted to read this, this quote from John Paul II. And this is from Memory and Identity. 
um, the English translation is 2005. This is page 12. He says this, if we wish to speak rationally about good and evil, we have to return to St. Thomas Aquinas. That is to the philosophy of being. With the phenomenological method, for example, we can study experiences of morality, religion, or simply what it is to be human and draw from them a significant enrichment of our knowledge. Yet we must not forget that all these analyses implicitly presuppose the reality of the absolute being and also the reality of being human, that is being a creature. If we do not set out from such realist presuppositions, we end up in a vacuum. And this certainly goes at your translation in that communio where he he thinks he talks about Shaler and phenomenology and basically says it's limited and it, we we need to have this metaphysical foundation or else we do end up in this vacuum that's right just just ask how people understand uh what man is or the human person is yes uh, if you strictly separate yourself from being you will understand man as a unity of experiences, of lived experiences, as we would say, as I would say, uh, to use a very technical language. But that's all there is. There is some kind of aggregation of these uh, changes, of these um, experiences uh, in your consciousness, and uh, if you don't have metaphysics. And Wojtyla, in the person and act, at the beginning, speaks about consciousness. And he simply wants to say, uh, look, consciousness is a property of the person. Yes, we are going to talk about experiences, about uh, lived experiences that man has when he acts. But uh, remember that these experiences appear in the human subject who is a being. That is, consciousness is not a human subject. It's simply a property of a human subject. And, and, and uh, you know, he, right at the beginning of his book, he notes that so there there is no mistake that that he does not uh, break with um with being but philosophizes on its basis yeah and just for viewers when we talk about realism we're talking about realism as a philosophical tradition so like plato and aristotle augustine aquinas realism simply means that there is an objective truth and we can know what it is and it's not dependent on us, it just exists. So that would, that would be opposed to all sorts of different forms of relativism. So John Paul II is a realist in that sense. Um, that's, that's right. Yes. If you are an idealist, that means you really think that everything that you know, that you uh, experience comes from you ultimately, that you basically construct uh, the world. Um, so there's some kind of, uh, you, can, you can talk about excessive rationalism. Uh, otherwise, you can also be an uh, empiricist uh, with some kind of excessive, um, with, with, with an agnostic uh, approach. Namely, you focus, you, you, you think that reality is limited to the visible and to the sense data that you receive into yourself and you maybe construct some, some ideas or, or something like this. And uh, Wojtyla is neither. He is a really profound realist and just a matter of how to understand this reality. And the fact is that he uses experience. Yes, he goes, in a sense, back to experience. That's, that's, the, that's the phenomenologist in him, goes to experience as the source of our contact with reality. Because how do we know about it? We know it through our senses. And, um, and then, of course, through our intellect and, and will. But uh, he goes back to uh, experience as, as, as uh, in a sense, uh, the source of what we know about reality. And hence, he, uh, he likes phenomenology in addition to metaphysics. Yes. Well, let's, let's because, talk about... Because, yeah. and, and when you see, for example, in person and act, when he starts talking about the person, he doesn't start, strictly speaking, from a definition. He will say, well... The purpose of this book is to understand the human person better. And then we, he wants to do it with the help of experience. And namely, the more strictly speaking, the ex man's experience of his action and the action of others. Excellent. Yeah, so let's talk more about person and act. Um, one of the interesting things that you had said to me when we were talking privately was how the, 
the previous English translation um, removed a lot of the Latin terms and whatnot and sort of tried to make it out like he was sort of only a phenomenologist and not Thomist. Can you tell us about the prior English translation and your new English translation? Yes, my new Eng English translation is uh, superior to the old one. Let's, <laughs> let's, <laughs> let's put it right there. Uh, I'm not shy about that. Um, but um, yes, the, the, the old English translation, it was translated by um, Andrzej Potocki um, and was edited by Anna Teresa Timiniecka. Uh, Anna Teresa Timiniecka was a professor. Uh, he, she was a phenomenologist and she was a friend also of John Paul II. And um, John Paul II collaborated with her in uh, producing the English edition. Well, the problem was that she took liberties with that translation and edited it as she saw fit. Indeed, she removed uh, almost all the references to St. Thomas. Uh, she, uh, from the text, uh, she replaced Latin terms like suppositum with uh, English equivalents, which, by the way, were not translated consistently. So, you, you know, the same, the same term would be translated in all sorts of different ways. And that is very confusing and not, not being faithful to the original text. And so, um, Vitiwa saw those problems. I mean, he was a man who, for whom the other human person was more important than his own work. And many times he would uh, trust others with his work or even give manuscripts away and so forth. Uh, it's because of his great love for another person. And unfortunately, sometimes these texts were edited by others and uh, without authorization. Uh, Sometimes these editors say that they had Wojtyla's authorization, but in my work, um, uh, the principle of, of arriving at the authoritative text of person and act is uh, simply um, the text that he wrote himself, the first edition of the book, and then subsequent changes that he made to the text, which he did in his own writing. So these are, these are the changes that were included and uh, uh, brought into the main text. And everything else that was uh, edited um, was placed in the uh, scholarly apparatus and uh, put in the end notes. So we, the problem is nobody has the authoritative Polish edition. Uh, so, but uh, because of the extensive work I did in the archive, uh, we arrived at a uh, an edition that was we know for sure that was written by uh, Wojtyla. Yeah, it's excellent. I, I've ordered my copy and it hasn't arrived yet, but uh, I plan to. We'll, we'll be going through that over with uh, CatholicCulture.org. Thomas Myers over there and, and I will be uh, podcasting on your translation, so we'll be discussing it. So I'm um, really excited to get that. Um, it, and from what you describe and what I've read from Weigel. It's really the it, previous previous English edition was really not really a translation. It was an interpretation and a paraphrase, uh, which if, if anyone's done any translation work, that's that's just uh, not really proper, uh, totally inappropriate. And as I understand it, all the all the other Voitua scholars or many of them, at least all didn't like this English translation. They thought it was not faithful to Voitua. So oh, and, yeah. and it was a very difficult to decipher what what really meant. I'm not saying that he's an easy writer. Yes, um, as you know, uh, there is a standing joke that his uh, Polish edition of, of Person and Act was used in the purgatory as a punishment <clears throat> for priests, I believe. Um, the, um, the English translation, the old English translation is was used in hell. Uh, yes. Yikes. <laughs> My translation... <laughs> I don't know about my translation. Yours is the one in, in the, the 12th level uh, of paradise. In paradise, paradise. Right. <laughs> <laughs> at, least, at least on earth. Yes. <laughs> well, um, so let's talk more about the content of Person and Act. Uh, Weigel says that uh, Bishop Wojtyla started writing it at Vatican II. And I believe it's 69 when it actually gets published. But it's he, he wrote it, says Weigel, as a, uh, a way to 
provide further philosophical foundation for Vatican II. So how important is it for us to understand Vatican II and John Paul II to understand person and act? Oh, yes, that's, that's another big question. And uh, I thought about this. And the only connection that I, I, I see a, f- a couple of connections. <clears throat> First is because Wojtyla understood, because St. John Paul II understood a uh, human person as, a, as being in fundamental relation to God, as being uh, the image of God, as being uh, called to be in communion, and of course, through grace, being able to enter into that uh, deep, uh, profound communion with God, accept God into his heart. Um, he, uh, the work on the human person is, uh, in person and act, is a certain way of showing the greatness and the transcendence of the human person. The human person is not simply reduced to, uh, to the material changes in the world but is a subject unique and unrepeatable that has uh, intellect and will and can determine himself in and through action. And that, that, that's all in, um, uh, in the book. So in a sense, um, you kind of wonder at the being that the, the human person is uh, that can respond to divine revelation and enter into communion with God. And Vaitiva also, not only first he focuses on the man as an individual and his experiences of action. So, for example, these two main experiences that he uh, determines are um, or distinguishes are the moment of efficacy, as he calls it. That is, I when I act, I have the experience that I am the agent of my action. That this action originates from me. And second is the, uh, for example, the moment of uh, freedom. Of freedom, that is, I can do this, but I don't have to. So that that suggests uh, that adds to our understanding of the human person uh, having a great dignity. It adds to um, to the fact that um, man, in some sense, is self-determinant. Of course, we have to be careful and not understand it in any kind of modernistic way, because uh, this self-determination is, for for Wojtyla, always rooted in the fundamental relation to God, always rooted in what we call uh, how he understood uh, the reality um, as a recipient, human person as a recipient of of a gift from God. uh, Anyway, so this is the, the focus on the human person would be would be an understanding the human person from a, what is so valuable about human person, what is uh, understanding human person's transcendence and how this transcendence is manifested in and through uh, the human body. Uh, that is one uh, one way of uh, linking or, or understanding person and act as a kind of philosophical foundation of uh, Vatican II. Another way that I see it, that I would like to mention, is the relation between person and act and love. We said that John Paul II was always interested in human love, was was a man of love. Uh, He wanted to understand love and implement it in his life. And um, uh, I have a I have, I think I'll write about this. Uh, actually, I wrote a little piece on that um, topic. Uh, it's not published yet, but uh, I see that person and act is a way of um, showing in which way man is capable of, of love, of, of um, performing, freely performing acts of love. And that, of course, enters into, into the understanding of the Second Vatican Council, understanding of God's love and revelation and man's, man's response to that revelation. Yes, yeah, so it's certainly a, a fundamental text also after love and responsibility. And of course, freedom is critical to love uh, as a free act. 
Exactly. We are talking about free acts of love and not acts of free love. It's fundamentally different. Yes, yes. Free acts of love, not free love. <laughs> Good distinction. Um, what about the Thomism of person and act? That's something that you brought back into your English translation. Tell us about the Thomism present there. Uh, Thomistic presence of in person and act, definitely, as I, as I mentioned, uh, the whole discussion about consciousness and its functions, you can see that, um, that a Thomistic uh, Thomistic thought and principles be in, uh, in a sense, being the basis for his consideration of the human person, even though he looks at the experience of the person of his own of his action. Uh, he, I mean, that's the one uh, one of the difficulties of actually understanding the book is is the fact that um, that you, in a sense, you have to look at the, at your own experience. To understand what Wojtyla is saying about about person and uh, and action, but um, and of course there is this whole difficulty of integrating these two uh, two philosophical traditions, metaphysics and uh, phenomenology. Um, but uh, speaking about the two mystic mystic principles in the book. Um, one of the greatest principles that I, uh, I see in the book, and Wojtyla is open about this, is the principle that action follows upon being, uh, operatio sequitur esse. Wojtyla talks about this, and it's, it's basically uh, the idea that Wojtyla takes into the book, into the methodology that he uses uh, to arrive at a better understanding of the person, namely, you look at, if you want to understand a being, some, someone, a person, <clears throat> consider, you have, have to consider what this person does, how he acts, and so forth. <clears throat> but with you approaches this, so approaches this from the perspective of internal experience. Okay, but, but nonetheless, it is true that uh, the, the, the metaphysical presuppositions are present in, in his book. Uh, unless you had some any other uh, aspect I can speak of, because well, I've definitely that's all that comes to my mind. Right yeah, now. well, I definitely noticed that reading love and responsibility. There certainly is a metaphysical presupposition um, that is that I feel present in the text and in the ideas um especially so because he, 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 he starts the book talking so much in sort of a phenomenological way and then there's i think it's like part three or four is justice toward the creator and so it's framing all of this in in the the being of man in relationship with god um any other aspects of person and acts that you'd like to uh touch on um well, we spoke about the transcendence, the, the, the transcendence of the human person. But you also talks about something called integration. Um, you could you could speak about certain immanence of the person in the act. That is, the he looks at 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 uh, at uh, uh, so to say to use the language of uh, phenomena, phenomenon of action, and so he. Um, he sees that um, well, one aspect I want to say is the integration between transcendence and, and immanence. That is, uh, he speaks not only about transcendence, but also about uh, the psychosomatic dynamisms in the person. That is, he does not leave the human body and, uh, and the psyche outside of the equation, so to say. So, um, in one of the most profound uh, insights that you can derive from the book is the um, the fact that a human person expresses himself in and through his body that the body is able to express the transcendence of the human person in his theological writings john paul ii will speak about the body being created to express love yes he calls it the spousal meaning of the body simply body is such a beautiful instrument you know it's perhaps 
perhaps could be misunderstood if, if I use this, this word, but um, it's a beautiful reality that can uh, express um, the reality of love. And uh, hence, hence this insight about the, the unity of of transcendent and and um, and immanent is uh, worth exploring. Excellent. Uh, and at the end, he talks. He has a kind of an outline of of um, of community. He talks about a personalistic understanding of the common good and how uh, we relate to others. How in our work, or he calls it co-action, uh, so with others, together with others how we retain, uh, obtain, attain fulfillment and retain our, our uh, personal value. That is, I think if uh, communists were uh, smart enough and reading that section, they probably would uh, censor the book. But um, as one of the professors said, well, they did not understand it. So Wojtyla was safe. <laughs> yes, uh, but that's also very anti-modernist, as you said, because the modernists are all about imminence only against transcendence. So integrating those two together. Um, what about freedom and truth? Does he talk at all about freedom and truth as well in person and act? Yes, yes, yes. You can see, you can see how he uh, poses the greatness of the human person in relation to truth. He calls it, uh, he has some phrases that are amazing. He talks about uh, the human person uh, uh, being standing in truth um it's 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 that in order to develop and to um, uh, reach fulfillment the human person it has to be based on on truth on the truth about the human person uh what the human person is uh so no definitely uh, that theme is uh, present uh in uh in person and act it it, it has to be so, so ultimately, that foundation in truth and is comes from um, from uh, man's relation to God, and even through his nature. Uh, Wojtyla speaks about conscience, for example, and you can see that uh, when he understands conscience, it's it's a way of a certain you know a confirmation of that that um, of human transcendence. Of, of a certain link or a bridge uh, to truth, or rather confirmation that one is already created in it and, and that one should not forget about this in his action. Excellent. Well, Dr. Natik, any final thoughts on person and act or just the greatness of John Paul II? Um, uh, not really. Uh, I, I think he was uh, definitely, he was a great man. He proves that by his life, uh, by his love that he had uh, for others. And that um, a, great, a great mind, great uh, thinker, philosopher, and, and uh, a pastor, um, theologian too. Uh, I would just say that he's a model to imitate and a true model of imitation. Um, and um, yes, a model of, of, of an obedient son and also of a merciful uh, father. Excellent, thank you. Well, uh, the Person and Act, Volume 1 is, uh, or Complete Works, Volume 1, Person and Act is linked below along with Dr. Ignatik's translation of Love and Responsibility as well as his own work on Wojtyla. Uh, you can also purchase the Communio issue I mentioned that's uh, a nice introduction as well. Um, any, uh, Dr. Dantic, any? what are you currently working on? What are your future projects? Oh, yes. Well, uh, the project of uh, publishing the works of Wojtyla <clears throat> is an ongoing one. Yes, the first volume with Person and Act uh, was just released this year uh, in May. And I'm working on volumes two, three, four, and five. Uh, volume two with uh, Lublin Lectures and Wojtyla's works on Shaler will probably be published next year. And, and we want to, uh, to publish uh, all his philosophical, theological, pastoral, and uh, literary output. Uh, we meaning, um, I refer to the initiative of 
the uh, St. John Paul II, the John Paul II Institute in Washington, DC, uh, with the support of the Knights of Columbus. Uh, so it's going to be a long project, uh, probably 14, 15 volumes overall, uh, plus volumes on John Paul II. Um, so a very long project. Uh, other than that, um, um, I have one book that I've been working on. This is a book on uh, Karl Wojtyla and his contributions and interpretation of the encyclical Humana Vitae. And um, that's really that's really it for greater, bigger projects. Excellent. Well, that'll be um, certainly another controversy, uh, which uh, John Paul II certainly handled uh, beautifully with Humanae Vitae. So that'll be a great work, great contribution. Well, Dr. Nati, thanks so much for your time today. Thank you for all your great work uh, translating and um, distilling this thought. Um, so I, I hope this has been helpful for audience to appreciate the greatness of John Paul II, help us understand him better. So let's close out with an Our Father, as we always do, uh, asking for a, a true conception of man. Uh, certainly the errors that John Paul II was combating are still with us today. And so that uh, ourselves in our own spiritual lives, as well as those of our neighbor, we can have this understanding of man, both transcendent and imminent, uh, by means of the gospel. Nomine Patris, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Pater noster qui es in Cedis, sanctificetur nomen tuum, adveniat regnum tuum, fiat voluntas tua, sicut in cello et in terra. Nem nostrum quotidianum da nobis hodie, et dimite nobis debita nostra, sicut et nos dimitimus debitoribus nostris. Et ne nos inducas in tentationem, sed libera nos amalo. Nomine Patris, et Fili, Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Jesus is King. Amen.